Uh, our fourth speaker today is um, Professor Ray Jack, uh, for many years, um, Professor of Ancient History at Reading, and um, one of the leading scholars um, of the history and historiography um, of, of the Jewish people and their cultural interaction with the Hellenistic and uh, Roman worlds around them, starting with uh, her still um, <coughs> uh, central book on Josephus of 1983, leading to, I think, most recently, uh, translation and Survival, the Greek Bible and the Ancient Jewish Diaspora. And since I'm being pithy and short, I shall leave it at that, and we're looking very forward to her talk with a slightly different title of Romanization in Judea, the Changing Places of Masada. Professor. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, I shall try to imitate Tony's impeccable timing. I feel very insecure without segments. I feel I need segments. <laughs> Um, as you can see um, from up there, I take Romanization to be okay, well, conceptually okay, pro tem, um, uh, with a Z at any rate. Um, but what I will be looking at is its discomforts, and that um, speaks to the question mark of um, the, in the title of our session. Um, the the s change there... Um, of the title, well, we will still have um, several faces and several faces of the same persons, too. Uh, we'll roam around places a little bit, but I have decided to focus on um, one uh, space, and that is Masada. Um, most obviously, the uh, Masada in the Judean desert is the perfect symbol of resistance to Roman rule and of the afterlife of such resistance. Um, you may detect here signs of my current work on the reception of Josephus, which will come in from time to time. This is the defensive position occupied from the beginning of the first Jewish revolt against Rome to which rebels congregated with their families after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 CE. They strengthened and held the site, and after withstanding a siege of indeterminate length, perhaps six months, they were persuaded, we learn, by their leader, Eleazar ben Yair, though not without difficulty, avo to avoid servitude, torture, humiliation, and disgrace through a planned collective suicide. Thus they robbed the Romans of their full victory, though I guess the Romans were mainly pleased to get home again. Um, ignore the New Testament uh, uh, designation down there. For the other slides, I, I very acknowledge um, the assistance of Barbara Burrell and Guy Stiebel, who I think you'll be hearing in July. If we put together the stunning surrounding landscape the forbidding flat-topped, diamond-shaped, sloping rock tapering um, to the north, some 400 metres high, with its unmistakable terraced northern uh, outline. Give you a few different images there. You've seen the outline. There you begin to see something of the landscape, and there the Roman cap. So put together the landscape with the visual remains beneath of the Roman army presence in the shape of eight very visible camps and a surrounding siege wall, and then add the narrative by the historian Josephus of the Jewish rebels' last stand, and to him we know all our knowledge, and that collective suicide in 73 or 4 CE, we get out of Masada a lasting lieu de mémoire, a site of memory. Is it the Teutoburger forest of Judea, crucible of Jewish ethnic identity? Well, unfortunately, unlike the unknown but imagined site of Arminius Hermann's battle in the middle of the great German forest, this is not a lieu de victoire. A bit more Roman ramp and a very misty Hermann, my own photograph there, and it was pouring with rain, um, <laughs> taken at Detmold. J 
Josephus's description. His words seem typically exaggerated, but sadly, a very recent fatal accident has been reported of a student tourist indeed falling down the cliff from the snake path <laughs> and um, being killed. In Josephus' context, this is not mere ekphrasis, nor detail of purely military interest. The concise physical evocation of the spectacular barren landscape matters. The unforgettable rock with its sheer sides and deep gullies all around, and also the evocation of the noteworthy history of its development. A Hasmonean founder, he will tell us. Herodian transformation, splendor and defensive strength. Those are the setting to his final drama in Jewish War 7. His history gives us, after this, only a few small episodes and reflections, and then draws to a close. Today, we view Josephus' descriptions of place, even as we read, through the prism of readily available images of the site, such as um, those here, and especially in the light of its 20th century archaeology. There is a long history to that archaeology to that archaeology and some work is ongoing. But the high profile excavations in 1963 to 5, staged managed by the highly talented archaeologist, entrepreneur, writer, statesman and ex-commander in chief, Igal Yadin, with hundreds of international volunteers and the support of the Observer newspaper in London, seems a far cry from things today, but they recently organized a little 50th anniversary exhibition in their lobby, which perhaps one or two people will have seen. Um, those um, really put Masada, put Masada on the world stage. Yadin masterminded the exposure of Herod's palaces, baths, storehouses, walls, and other, other fairly remarkable installations. Most dramatically and seemingly miraculously, he revealed evidence of the rebel defenders, not only their living quarters within the cells of the casemate wall. I hope maybe, ah, well, there you are, climbing the snake path. There again. Um, not only their living quarters, but personal relics, down to a pair of sandals, a plait of hair, food items, and a number of skeletons. He managed even to find in the Northern Palace what were acclaimed as the ten suicide lots. There were actually eleven, by which the last to die determined who was to kill the rest, including one lot that fortunately does seem to be inscribed Ben Yair. I'm not sure if I have it. Oh, well, that gives you, it's a different nearby excavation, but something of the spirit of enthusiasm. Um, he also found vague ki uh, various kinds of ballista balls, arrowheads of a type now thought by Jody Magnus to be likely forged by the rebels, interestingly enough, and body armour, which no doubt will be discussed in July. Um, all this was the basis for the sub subsequent creation of a UNESCO World Heritage Site, of which you see part of the citation and then some major tourist venue and a backdrop for summer opera, Tosca this year, which seems appropriately <laughs> suicidal. <laughs> what makes the place all the more suggestive, and especially for us today, is that this one and the, one and the same rock encapsulated both Romanization of a particular kind and resistance. Yadin, ever the great publicist, paired these two phases in Masada's history in the title of his popular publication. But it is remarkable, um, and the symbolism at first blush stark and clear. Then, the more we unpack it, the more the story that Masada tells us becomes one about the limits and problems of Romanization in the Judean context. The ambiguities inherent in subjection to an imperial power and the ambivalences, particularly in the position of members of those very elites whom we view as the beneficiaries and who are clearly crucial to um, the management of the system and perhaps to a certain trickle-down process. I hadn't expected that to be where this exploration would take me. So first, Herod. In his kingdom, Herod, we have here, yeah, have a bit of Herod. In his kingdom, Herod overtly uh, pushed 
um, the external manifestations of public and indeed political <coughs> Romanization. Here, one cannot doubt agency. He did this through diplomacy, personal friendships and alliances, notably with the Princeps, whose second best friend, you'll remember, he was supposed to be. Through the exercise of empire-wide largesse and patronage, Josephus calls him megalopsuchos and euergestic autotos. With conspicuous expenditure, entertainments and festivals, such as the Great Games, to mark the foundation of his um, artificial harbour and city of Caesarea. Also in the lifestyle of his court in the various palaces. In the heartland of Judean, Judea proper, the Jewish, the Jewish territory, the newly appointed high priestly clans of Jerusalem were perceived to be flaunting their fine mansions with their non-figurative mosaic floors within range of the Temple Mount, as visible in the burnt house quarter excavations um, in today's uh, Jewish quarter of Jerusalem. Um, and as you'll see, I um, will come back to this question of Judea proper, but the title that Dominic gave me actually got me thinking. Building was Herod's most valuable currency and his trademark. He was not unique in this among Rome's so-called client kings, <coughs> allied rulers. Archelaus of Cappadocia has been usefully compared, for one. But he beat them all hands down in terms of scale, inventiveness, and sheer chutzpah. Herod's architectural heritage is in many features <coughs> Roman in both structure and decoration. Brick facings of the distinctive opus reticulatum, floor tiling of a particular kind, cement, um, according to David Jacobson, are likely to have been created by Roman craftsmen, perhaps, as argued by Gideon Forster, in a local workshop. Baths at Jericho, Herodium, and Masada are complete with all the appropriate systems, rooms, and installations. The list can go on and on. Debates continue, it is true, about what is perhaps Hellenistic, especially in smaller bathhouses and theatres. One scholar even classifies the Hippodrome of Caesarea as Hellenistic because of some technical details rather than Roman. I think it's the orientation of the starting gates. While on Masada itself, the possibly earlier Western Palace may have had more Hellenistic features than the Northern Palace. But at this level, it hardly mattered to Herod. The fusion was Roman, and the general picture is clear. Various scholars claim even more for Herod by way of Romanization. Um, thus, Duane Roller. Herod was instrumental in the diffusion of the Augustan architectural revolution into the provinces, and was the first to build outside Italy such Italian architectural forms as the basilica, amphitheater, villa, and Italian temple. I'm not going to stop and uh, examine all of those. I'll be pleased to hear. Herod's legacy provided a groundwork for the architectural Romanization of the East, the word is used by Roller, influencing the construction of the great temple complexes and fal palaces so familiar from later Roman architecture. So he's talking about a much wider region, um, not only than Judea, but even than, than, than Palestine and southern Syria. In keeping with his parade of Roman styles, Herod was good with water. Aqueduct supplied not only what was basic to life, but the wherewithal for the life of luxury, supplying pools and baths, fountains, and garden irrigation at Caesarea, Jerusalem, Jericho, Herodian, and elsewhere. At Masada, enormous plastered cisterns stored the water of the sporadic flash floods of the desert. With these constructions, too, Herod showed his subjects and the world that he could tame the forces of nature and make a permanent mark on the landscape. Even more was this the case with the huge fills and platforms of the pagan temple of Sebastian Samaria, his own tomb and palace fortress in Herodian, and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem itself. In constructing the artificial port at Caesarea, he conquered Ephilonei Kaysen, a recalcitrant anti prasonta spot, according to the Jewish war. This goes a long way towards explaining Herod's staggering gig gig what Herod's staggering gigantism is all about. Um, uh, wait, we'll leave that for a minute. Um, the Temple Mount the was the largest sanctuary site in the world, 144,000 square meters. Columns of his royal stoa in Jerusalem had a diameter equal to three men's arms. 
we're told. The hallmark, huge blocks of often finely chiselled stone of the retaining wall of the Temple Mound, paralleled now under water in Caesarea, weighing often more than a ton, say it all. Taking nature, um, uh, ta uh, taming nature has perhaps um, uh, uh, Roman parallels, but it seems to morph from the Roman to the regal. However, Herod took great care not to aggrandize himself without also honoring Augustus and the imperial family, especially through the names that he gave to his creations or part of parts of them. A tendency again noted by Josephus, who sums up that no suitable spot in the kingdom was devoid of a mark of honor to Caesar. One thinks of, of, of today's naming in, uh, 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 uh. Uh, after every possible donor and uh, philanthropist. Apart from Caesarea and Sebasti, which of course the Greek for Augustus, and Phidon in Gaza was named after Agrippa. And then there are further opportunities in individual buildings. In Caesarea, the highest and finest star was Drusion after Augustus's stepson, a successful general who died in 9 BCE. The two parts of the royal palace at Jerusalem were Caesarea and Agrippaeum. Herod's motivation in his building program may even have been consciously to flatter Augustus through imitation. It's been claimed that the very idea of public building on a large scale visibly came from the princeps. And of course, there were temples <coughs> devoted to the imperial cult outside Jerusalem. There were major shrines at Sebasti, at Paneon in the far north, a temple of white marble, very showy, and another still in the process of being understood at Omrit, along the road from, uh, Pane, from Paneon. And of course, in the administrative centre, Caesarea, on the coast, where the Temple of Rome and Augustus, adorned with statues, stood centrally on a high platform overlooking the harbour, Herod's intentions could not be mistaken. And I think one can speak of intentions as deduced from what we see. Masada exemplifies much of this. We don't know if the bits of it were named anything, but it's a conquest of nature for sure. It has not one, but two large palaces and some small buildings, um, uh, also labeled palaces in the publications. It adopts the familiar Pompeian styles of wall decoration and mosaic. Its monumental baths survive in good shape, and there was also a small bathhouse. Finds attest to the drinking of Roman vintage wine, um, labeled uh, uh, for Herod, so shipped specially to him. the terraces of three terraces of the Northern Palace. The Northern Palace terraces um, have been compared in their conception in some of the detail to terraced Roman villas in Italy, no notably the so-called Villa Giulia on the island of Pandateria, Ventone. Semicircular reception rooms, if that is what the top terrace here actually was, find several palaces in Rome. At the same time, Herod's Northern Palace required um, terrific underpinning. Um, there you get a picture of the three um, terraces and the underpinning over there. Some wall paintings and floor tiling and a mosaic from the bathhouse. familiar types of Roman baths. One parallel from Jericho. Yet Herod's Masada doesn't speak in a straightforward way of doing the Roman thing. It's in the middle of the Judean wilderness by an inhospitable sea that is the lowest in the world, one of the most intolerably hot places in the region. It's totally a palace fortress, one of a string of such built or refurbished by Herod. His predecessor, Hasmonean rulers, seem to have constructed them. It was Herod who built the casemate wall around the site. It's regal, despotic even. Acres of storerooms groaning with fastidiously ordered label supplies were on display. We still saw the storerooms in that general view. 
A large kingly entourage and many dependents will have stayed there intermittently, but continuous maintenance by hosts of servants and slaves will no doubt have been required. Some areas were apparently given over to crops. For this liking to combine functions and purposes, we may compare the more recently e excavated Herodian, the bizarre palace town tomb that Herod created for himself within sight of Jerusalem on the margin of this same wilderness, hidden away halfway up the hill and commemorating a family accident. There, just a few years ago, the late Ehud Netzer may well have uncovered the royal sarcophagus. Moreover, although we are very much talking Roman, the Masada Northern Palace is also in spirit reminiscent of the hybrid design of certain of the Petra tombs, should we say orientalizing, and probably it's Alexandrian influenced, if we're to go with Judith Mackenzie. In truth, there's something strange about Herod's Masada, unsettling, even dysfunctional. And Masada was not alone. When Marcus Agrippa visited Judea in 15 BC, we are explicitly told that the visit included entertainment at three of Herod's hilltop residential fortresses, Alexandreon, Hyrcania, and Herodium itself. Masada isn't mentioned. It's important to note that the Romanizing that I've mentioned belongs much more outside Judea, apart from the loyalist naming of parts of his palace and, of course, what happened indirectly to the high, priest, high priestly class. If Josephus's report to believe, is to be believed, a, a, an amphitheatre too was erected somewhere in, on the hill, in the hills near to Jerusalem. The desert fortresses, though, only go to prove the point of the general avoidance of Judea. The imperial cult came nowhere near it, as we noted. What Herod did for Judea was actually of a very different character. The complete reconstruction of the Jerusalem temple apparently following the template of Solomon's great creation as described in Kings and Chronicles. A labor of decades employing ostensibly in accordance with the law only Jewish masons and a huge um, economic enterprise too, of course. It was apparently the largest of its kind during the short time of its existence. It was the glory of the East as attested not only by Josephus but by Roman writers. Sacrifices on behalf of Augustus and Livia, it is true, joined the round of biblically prescribed offerings. But for all its global impact and its Roman inflection, the Jerusalem temple was insistently un-Roman in appearance, rhythms, and rituals. There was rather little give in Judea. The development of Masada and similar sites was the result. Herod seems to have understood that. Herod's Masada then dominates the top of the mountain physically. Are we doing for time? And yet, as we've seen, it is dwarfed by Masada's role as a symbol of resistance and by events that left their own remarkable but far smaller physical footprint. This has become one of the world's great resistance stories. <coughs> but that situation, too, is far more nuanced than it seems at first sight. Here, the convolutions are so tortured that it's hard to know where to begin. So let's start with what is simple. It's rare indeed for historians of the ancient world to be able to get anywhere near the experience of the subjects or victims of empire. Through the events that supposedly took, though the events that supposedly took place here were accounted for us by the greatest Romanizer of them all, Flavius Josephus, whose account is an indispensable necessary, indispensable accompaniment to the physical traces, at Masada, we still can, I contend, do just that. And that's in spite of, or perhaps even because of, Josephus' strident and consistent denunciations of the rebels throughout his history of the Jewish war, including the tour de force of invective that precedes the Masada section, in spite of his own elite and priestly status and his landowning um, position, in spite of his shape shifting, that changing sides from rebel general to maker of a suicide pact with his comrades, to dodger of that pact, to surrendered prisoner of war, to active presence in the Roman camp, and in spite of his closeness to the winning generals Vespasian and his son Titus, 
as the accidental prophet who sanctioned their rise to the imperial purple and then received their patronage, which was still active at the time of writing. Josephus even seems to have been acquainted with the Roman tribune Nicanor, to whom he surrendered. It's undeniable that as a writer he was constrained by his ongoing relationship with the Roman emperors, as Vespasian had become by the time of writing, gagged in some respects, obligated in others, and most painful of all, drawn to include in his war history um, a detailed technicolour description of the Roman triumph over Judea captor, which precedes the Masada narrative. He confesses to his readers that his role continued to be controversial among certain of his countrymen <coughs> while he was attacked as a former rebel by outsiders. At the same time, for his Jewish readers particularly, Josephus' work, works were a large-scale repository of communal memory. He introduced himself in the preface to the Jewish War as a sharer in his people's lamentation, a role he already assumed, we must suppose, when he sent his Aramaic report on the war to the peoples of the East, or to the Jewish people in the East. It's not too clear. He tells us that he participated in the interminable examinations, castigations, and post-mortems of the 70s and 80s, sending his work out to be read by people of importance, including Herodians, the descendants of Herod, who were still messing around in Judea, exchanging letters about the content, vying with a rival historian, Justice of Tiberius. In other words, Josephus was in the thick of the conversation. It is, an, it is as an evolution of, out of that conversation of the defeated that I think we can most usefully approach his iconic encapsulation of resistance, the Masada story. The episode, as Josephus shaped and recounted it, <coughs> vividly actualizes and ultimately enshrines what, after all, was a fight to shake off Roman rule and to give it meaning. It's designed to carry the reader, to stir and to inspire, and that's how it was mainly received until relatively recently. And that is because Josephus has chosen to make of the suicide of the Masada remnant a climax and a drama. This is more than just literary display, though Josephus is certainly no averse to quite a lot of that. It's post-war writing, some kind of rescue operation, part of that Jewish conversation, and a counterpoise to his own other showpiece, The Roman Triumph. It's become rather fashionable to claim that Josephus made it all up. And in such claims, the speeches um, that he ascribes to the leader Eleazar ben Yair loom large. It should certainly come as no surprise, however, those recent snipers have hailed it as a great discovery, that Josephus puts, invents two big speeches for him, speeches in praise of dying to remain free. Um, Elias, uh, historiographic follow he follows historiographical convention, of course, and his own practice throughout his writings. I hardly need um, re uh, explain that to this audience. Convention allows those speeches to draw, as they do, upon Greco-Roman models, and not only for their rhetoric. The philosophical turn, predominantly Platonic, is striking, above all in Ben Yair's second speech, of which a large part concerns the immortality of the soul. The speech exhibits, too, a range of Greek motifs, notably the exemplum of the philosophical Indians and their embrace of death. I'm not sure that I have given you that one. Also observable is a more subtle exploitation of historiographic models, both Greek and Roman, in echoes of the noble barbarian theme favoured by Roman historians, who were impressively <coughs> willing to write impassioned critiques of their own imperialism and to put into the mouths of preferably defeated enemy leaders, uh, such as the British Calgacus, quite severe um, censure. Paradoxically, it's Josephus, the non-Roman, who avoids direct criticism of the Roman imperial machine. For all that, the Masada speeches do appear to embody Eleazar ben Yair's central doctrine, the assertion of the supreme value of freedom, eleutheria, and the nobility of preferring death to slavery. 
we may ascribe to this a Jewish basis, bearing in mind the inscription Lecheirut Israel or and Yerushalayim, carried by the Jerusalem minted coinage that the rebels issued in years one to four of the revolt. Not a very good slide, I'm afraid. I'm certainly not going to be able to read it. It appears that the same ideology for take it from me. It appears that the same ideology fired subsequent revolts against Rome, of which we know so much less from the inside. So here we have it, represented by the arch-opponent Josephus. Digging deeper into this conception of freedom yields a connection with the core doctrine of the rebel groups that emerged out of opposition to the Roman census in 6 CE, that all, uh, all uh, human rule was illegitimate. Freedom had a special sense for Bible-based Jews. Possibly more damaging to Josephus' credit than the literary turn, and I should say the speeches in that way are hybrid representations of um, what Eleazar ben Yehir could have said. Possibly more damaging to Josephus' credit than the literary turn of the speeches might be implausibility in the events recounted, which are indeed unlikely to have unfolded in detail exactly as told. Why did the Roman soldiers wait a night on getting inside the surrounding wall on top of the rock? How could the two women who slipped away with their five children and who presumably became Josephus' informants know how the suicide proceeded after the moment of their departure? When it comes to the story itself, it turns out that there are a surprising number of literary precedents assembled in a very often cited article by Shia Cohen for a dramatic self-immolation by a military unit anticipating or immediately following disaster in the field. Sometimes the killing of wife and ch ch uh, wives and children is involved. There's substantial variation among the cases he reviews, which amount to over a dozen, but it wouldn't be out of place to speak of a topos, a conventional theme. It doesn't follow, however, that our story is pure invention. To these doubts may be added the question of possible confutation of the narrative by archaeology. Matches were certainly overstated by Yadin between text and findings in the first flush of excitement, and in the second flush, I suppose. <laughs> and perhaps they were simplistically used in his account to validate Josephus. Thus it appears that the ramp on the western side of Masada that eventually allowed access to the ballistae of the besiegers, a, ge a geological outcrop onto which the Romans heaped quantities of soil and sand, could simply not have held the stone platform that they supposedly built and no trace of any stones have been found. Where again are the signs of, one massive conf of the one massive conflagration in which, oh, there's the lot, which says Ben Yair. Um, where are the traces of one, the one massive conflagration in which all that remained to the defeated was supposed to have been burned? And what are we to make of the 25 skeletons found not where the suicide is located by Josephus, but towards the southeast? Though carbon dating makes them actually okay. Yeah. Why were there 11 lots, not 10, in the uniform group found together that contained the Ben Yair lot? How much of the suicide narrative should be discounted in response to such points and similar objections that have been raised is not an easy call and perhaps not a necessary call. Certainly, we don't need to think about it now. The debate will go on, but the essentials of the story, in my judgment, remain standing. And so we return to the voice of Josephus and to the ambivalence that we find under the surface. For us, in a sense, the most valuable testimony I find it fascinating, though on reflection not unexpected, that the suicide is at moments described by him in derogatory terms. There's the suggestion that the outcome of the same wild and temperate passion that had driven the rebel leaders and the demos, and the demos that had been won over or coerced by them earlier into revolt against all better counsel was here operative again. There's a, a hint that the females, who were presumably his informants on that fatal night, um, were um, not exactly impressive characters, belittled by him as being no better than the rest of their sex. Josephus is a, a pretty good misogynist. <laughs> More disturbingly, Eleazar's speech echoes rather 
see strangely and it seemingly inappropriately for the Josephine context, the devastating theme familiar from the rest of the Jewish war that the Jewish people are being punished for their sins and for the sins of the rebels in particular and that God has deserted them and transferred his favours to the Romans, at least temporarily. Nor had Josephus earlier hesitated to the recount the depths to which the rebels who occupied the site already in 66 on the outbreak of revolt were prepared to sink when they raided nearby in Gedi during the Passover and massacred its presumably Jewish inhabitants in order to avail themselves of their supplies. That's in Jewish War 4. So it's not surprising that interpreters have differed over Josephus' intended message. The difference is accentuated by the contrasting parallel with the speech that Josephus has had himself give to his fellow soldiers at Yotapata, the site of his own um, suicide bunk. There he produced every argument in the book to dissuade them from the collective suicide that he so conspicuously had managed to evade. And yet, I suggest, no resolution is needed for those very conflicting voices surely reflect the author's divided mind. On the one hand, even though he's told us of the unwillingness of some to participate in the killing of their families, hence the need for two speeches from Eleazar, one wasn't enough, we come away with a sense that whatever the backstory, the suicides of the besiegers were indeed an act of group heroism. This at least, uh, could accrue to their posthumous credit, even if not redeeming their sins. We do then seem to have uncovered in the what we seem sorry, what we seem to have uncovered is the divided mind of the colonial with deeply split loyalties, exacerbated by failure. Josephus' <coughs> commitment to people and community was, if anything, intensified after the catastrophe that had swept all away, including his own former life. But also intensified was his class hatred of those whom he held responsible. That's a pretty big divide um, in his own mind. When it came to handling the aftermath of the defeat and its conclusion at Masada, an episode which he did not, after all, need to highlight in his history, he stepped up to the plate. It was far from easy to acknowledge that those hated revolutionaries, whom he could not forgive for destroying the nation, had nonetheless in their deaths served her well, in a sense. He needed a thick skin. He could not, however, altogether stop himself from injecting bitter asides and a critical subtext. His life trajectory was like <coughs> no one else's, yet his problems are recognisable as those of so many members of conflicted colonial elites writ large, and I think it's useful to view him that way. In the Masada episode, he takes us into the tortured mind of a survivor of his class, facing the consequences of failure. Josephus owed his survival to the Romans, but he could not escape the multiple discomforts and worse that came with Romanization, as in his own way did Herod in his Judean kingdom. Perhaps too, the trapped elite of Judea and the directions they chose had had something to do with the capacity of this province to mount revolts in the first place. Mm -hmm.